Thank you, Chris. And it's a great pleasure uh, and privilege, as always, uh, to be a part of the Ligonier Conference. And uh, my task uh, this morning is to answer this uh, question, a question about uh, interpretation. How do I know that my interpretation is right? And the, the answer, the simple answer to that is when RC agrees with me. <laughs> and I was almost tempted to leave it at that. <laughs> Let me uh, read to you from Second Peter chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. This is God's holy and inerrant word. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure. Now, Peter's talking here about the transfiguration of Jesus, one of the most spectacular events in the entire history of redemption, one of those moments, I suppose, if you could travel back in time and be at one or two locations to be an eyewitness of this event, this would be one of them, the transfiguration of Jesus. When Luke, you remember, describes his garments shining as bright as a lightning flash, and there's this voice that speaks from heaven, the voice of God the Father that says, you are my beloved Son, and I love you. What could be more sure than that, to encounter that kind of revelation. And, and yet, Peter says, and we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible, and Peter here is speaking primarily here about the Old Testament Scriptures, as more sure than the revelation that he was an eyewitness to on the Mount of Transfiguration because all of Scripture, every jot, every tittle of it, is not the product of someone's own interpretation, but is the product of God 
driving along the prophets, carrying them along by the Holy Spirit, so that what is given to us in the Scripture is the very will, the very intent of Almighty God. So let me begin uh, there, that the Old and New Testament Scriptures, the 66 books written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek over a period of 1,500 years, 40 or so different human authors in various genres from law to history to architects' drawings to poetry to apocalyptic to gospel to letters, two million words reflecting ancient Near Eastern treaty covenant documents, reflecting Roman legal enactments, all of it, every word of it, every syllable of it, down to the least stroke of a pen is God's Word. Verbs and nouns and adjectives and adverbs and prepositions and conjunctions and interjections, all of it, God's holy, inerrant Word. I believe in plenary, verbal inspiration that the totality of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation in all of its diversity comes from ultimately one author, God Himself. So I believe that Wesley was correct when he said that if there is, if there is one error in the Bible, there might as well be a thousand. That if there is one falsehood in the Scriptures, it did not come from the God of truth. Scripture is God speaking. It is the very voice of God, not that it contains the voice of God, that as you read it, somehow in some way the voice of God emerges from the Scriptures. No. The Scriptures themselves, the words themselves, the verbs, the nouns, the pronouns, the conjunctions, the interjections, the adjectives, the adverbs, they are God's Word to us, infallible and inerrant. I stand behind the Reformation slogan, Sola Scriptura. I believe the Bible to be the Word of God because the Bible says it's the Word of God. That sounds circular, but think about it. There can be no higher authority than God, and if the Bible is God's Word, there's no higher authority than the Bible to corroborate that it is the Word of God. So that Calvin, in his magisterial institutes of the Christian religion next to the Reformation Study Bible is a required reading to get into heaven, Calvin's 1559 final edition of the Institutes, Calvin said, the Scriptures are autopistos, they are self authenticating. They authenticate themselves because God authenticates Himself, and the Bible is God's Word. Yes, you can bring 
evidentiary arguments to the Bible, as the Westminster Confession of the 17th century does and speaks of the heavenliness of the matter and the efficacy of the doctrine and the majesty of the style and the consent of all its parts and the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God and the full discovery of the way of salvation and the incomparable excellencies that are to be found in Scripture and the entire perfection thereof, all, all of those help us to confirm that the Bible is the Word of God, but ultimately the Bible is the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God. Now, I believe that when the Bible speaks to us through words, through nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs, what the Bible teaches us is true, whatever that may be. If, if the Bible is teaching us a scientific fact, then that fact is true. If the Bible is teaching us something about ourselves, it is true. If the Bible is teaching us something about the nature of the universe, it is true. If the Bible is teaching us something about the nature of God, it is true. I come to the Bible with an advance commitment to receive as truth from God all that the Scripture is found upon interpretation to be teaching. Well, that's all very well and good. But the Bible is full of contradictions. That's what everybody says. That's what the world says. That's what skeptics constantly say. Are there any contradictions in the Bible? No absolutely not. Are there things in the Bible that we don't understand? Absolutely yes. Are there things that we may never understand? Yes. Oh, let's look at a few of them. Matthew and Luke have different names for Joseph's father. Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Matthew and Luke have different names for Joseph's father. Matthew says his father, Joseph's father, was called Jacob. Luke says Joseph's father was called Heli. Now, Always assume that Bible writers, human Bible writers, are at least as clever as you are. Always make that assumption. Never ever assume that Bible writers were so dumb and stupid that it took you to see the conundrum. <laughs> that when Matthew wrote his gospel or Luke wrote his gospel, it never dawned on them that they were actually giving a different name to Joseph's father. Is there an explanation? Of course. There are at least two that are viable. One is that Joseph's mother was a widow who remarried, and that Joseph was the legal son of one and the physical son of another. There. 
that'll work. Or Heli was Mary's father, but there were no male heirs. So when they got married, they, they adopted in much the same way that we sometimes speak of our son-in-law as our sons. And how many times at a wedding have you heard that being said, welcome into our family, we want to regard you now as our son, not just son-in-law, but as our son, and adopts Joseph into the family. There. That'll work. Or Matthew 28 verse 1 says that at the resurrection, Mary Magdalene and another Mary are at the tomb when it begins to dawn. And Mark tells us in chapter 16 that Mary Magdalene, the mother of Jesus, and Salome was there. And John, not to be outdone, says Mary Magdalene was there. He, he doesn't say only Mary Magdalene was there, but he does say Mary Magdalene was there, but doesn't mention anyone else, but then says that when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, it was still dark. contradictions. Age, old, tiresome, weary contradictions. If Mary Magdalene and, Mar and, and, and another Mary and Salome were there, Mary Magdalene was there. So what John is saying isn't contradicting anything. If they left their home when it was still dark and arrived at the tomb when the sun was coming up, there's no contradiction here. So get over it. <laughs> or 2 Samuel 24 says, God provoked David to number the people. But Chronicle says Satan did it. Okay, Chronicles was written probably a long time after Samuel. God did it in Samuel, Satan did it in Chronicles. Maybe the author of Chronicles didn't know what was in the book of Samuel. No. God did it, Satan did it. Well, just a minute, didn't, didn't the prince of preachers last night tell us from Acts <laughs> chapter 2 of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost with a huge crowd and everything that he was saying was being written down and recorded because it was going to go into Scripture? And didn't he say about the crucifixion of Jesus that you, pointing to Jews in Jerusalem, you by wicked hands took him and slew him, but it was all by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You did it. It was all by God's divine decree. Who did it? Doesn't, doesn't Paul say in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You do it, God does it. God moved David, Satan moved David. God moved David using Satan as his tool. We could spend hours and hours. You can go to internet sites and type in discrepancies in the Bible, contradictions in the Bible, and and lots and lots of stuff will come up giving you lists and lists. Some of them are just plain silly. 
The Bible is true. The Bible is without error. But our understanding of the Bible is not without error. The Bible is without error, but our interpretation of the Bible may not be inerrant. So that's the question that Chris has put to me. And we need to be humble as we approach the Scriptures, because God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither His ways our ways. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, and those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. That sometimes we see through a glass darkly like, like fog, like mist that has clouded up the glass and we cannot see properly. Sometimes we are prone to resist the truth that is in the text. We know in part, God knows in full, and as Peter says about Paul, and I, I love this text, there are some things in Paul that are hard to be understood. Peter says that, that there are some passages in Paul that are difficult to be understood. So, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. We need to rightly understand the Scriptures. We need principles of correct interpretation of Scripture. Now, in our day and age in the 21st century, in post-modernity, we ask the question, or the question is asked, is there meaning in the text? Because in postmodern thinking, there cannot be one meaning in the text. The text contains many meanings. It's how many times have you ever heard people say, that's just your interpretation? It's the killer, isn't it? Because there is no response to that. That's, that's just your interpretation. This is um, orange, bronze. No, that's not going to work. That is black. But that's just my interpretation. R really? On my bookshelf in my library uh, are over a hundred volumes. I, I counted them. Uh, over a hundred volumes on hermeneutics, uh, on the science of interpretation, with a loss of confidence in the Bible's inerrancy with a loss of confidence in the principles of interpretation with the onslaught of post-modernity that questions everything and raises to the surface relativity of understanding, the buzz word today, of course, is hermeneutics. How do I understand? How do I interpret? This is why it is so important to have systematic theology. This is why it's so important to have, let me use a buzzword, a meta-narrative, a big picture, so that all the little details have some relationship to the bigger, broader picture. Allow me, allow me to reference the Westminster Confession, chapter 1 and section 9, the infallible rule of interpretation is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. Uh, that was the 17th century attempt to give some 
keys to how to interpret Scripture, especially when one Scripture seemed to be in conflict with another Scripture. So I have a ten-point plan of interpretation. Rule number one, what matters here is a hermeneutic for ordinary Christians. Let me put it that way. A, a hermeneutic that will work for ordinary Christians. There are, there are rules that are so complex, it's almost like a return to ancient Gnosticism. You, you, you have to have specialized degrees in ancient Near Eastern history, or you have to have specialized degrees in, in Hebrew before you can even begin to read the Bible for yourself. One of the key doctrines of the Reformation was the perspicuity of Scripture, that those things which are essential to believe for salvation, not everything to be sure, but those things which are essential for salvation can be discerned by ordinary Christians using the ordinary means of grace, by attending conferences, by going to church, by listening to sermons, by, by reading the Bible for themselves, by asking questions in a Bible study, uh, by, by resorting to, to dependable commentaries. You can come to a, a valid, true understanding of the essential principles of Scripture. I say that because there are fads about that suggest that a doctrine, a, a, an understanding, an interpretation has developed in the last 20 years taught by one or two or three people that no one else in the entire history of the church has ever understood. And this isn't about some peripheral issue tucked away in some obscure minor prophet. This is about justification. This is the answer to the question, how can I be saved? That the church never understood this until now. My friends, that is unbelievable. That is, that is heresy. We must have an interpretation for the people, that ordinary Christians through the ordinary means of grace can come to a valid understanding of those things which are essential, and justification is essential. Secondly, rule number two, Scripture has one meaning. It has many applications, but it has one meaning. From Augustine through the Middle Ages, uh, particularly in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, there was, a, there was a, a rule of interpretation that suggested that every text had four different meanings. Um, a literal meaning, an allegorical meaning, a theological or tropological meaning, and um, a moral meaning. Four entirely different meanings. Calvin said, when the literal will stand, that which is furthest from the literal is the worst. Scripture has one meaning, because behind it lies one mind. 
Th there are many authors, human authors, and you can, you can discern the difference between John's grammar and Mark's grammar. Mark is always in a hurry, and suddenly, and suddenly, and suddenly. That's, that's Mark. John is much more elevated. You can, you can give the same story and ask the question, who wrote this, Mark or John? And most of you would pick it out in a heartbeat. But behind those human authors lies one author, the mind of God through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit not a schizophrenic mind, not a confused mind, not a contradictory mind, not a mind of dialectical thought, but a rational, coherent mind. So rule number two, Scripture has but one meaning, but many applications. Rule number three, Scripture is its own interpreter. Scripture is its own interpreter. What, what do you do when you read in James that we are saved by works? And in Paul, that we are saved through faith apart from works. What do you do? Well, the first thing that you say is, these are not contradictory. There must be an explanation that makes sense of what seems to us on surface reading to be mutually contradictory truths. James is speaking of the evidence of faith. What is the nature of true saving faith? And true saving faith is always accompanied by works. A man who says he believes, but there are no works, that man does not have true genuine faith. That's all James is saying. He says it in a bold, stark way to make you listen. But Scripture is its own interpreter. Be careful, therefore, of building an entire doctrine on, on one text. That's why we need some modesty. If you push me into a corner, I'll tell you what I believe about Revelation 20 and the use of the word millennium, the thousand years. If you push me into a corner, I'll tell you what I believe. But we, we need to have some modesty about building an entire doctrine on one single text. Rule number four, interpret obscure passages in the light of those that are clear. Turn with me just for a second to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, and beginning at verse 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to, uh, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit in which He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to Him. Who are the spirits in prison? Are they unbelievers who have died? Are they Old Testament believers who have died? 
Are they fallen angels, as some interpret Genesis chapter 6 to mean that? When did Christ preach? Did He preach in between His death and resurrection? Did He preach in between His resurrection and ascension? Or did He preach in the days of Noah? Through Noah's preaching, Christ was preaching. What do you make of this text? There are some interpretations of this text that are clearly wrong. Any interpretation of this text that interprets the spirits in prison to mean some kind of purgatory, of which the Bible says absolutely nothing and, and insists that it is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. So, any interpretation that contradicts what the Bible says elsewhere cannot be correct. Let me come back to that passage later. Rule number five, pay attention to genre. Pay attention to genre. When, when the Bible says God is like a bird, a, a, a broody hen that clucks and has feathers and stretches out its wings and hides its little chicks underneath its feathers. God, I want to tell you something. All right, you can write this down. God does not have feathers. God does not cluck like a chicken. Now, I like chickens. I had a thing about chickens when I was growing up. I have lots of pictures of me when I was a little boy holding chickens, and I don't know what it was. It was a phase I passed through. I, 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 loved, I loved chickens, but God is not a chicken. We recognize the difference between narrative, didactic, poetry, apocalyptic? What's going on in the book of Revelation with a city that is this giant cube that sits on Mount Zion, but actually the cube stretches all the way over to Turkey and, and, and stretches down to Africa? It's, it's enormous and goes way above oxygen level. It's apocalyptic. It's a, it's a style of writing in which there are colors and numbers. It's, it's like the difference between, between an editorial in a newspaper, an opinion column in a newspaper, and a political cartoonist that expresses the same idea but in entirely different language. Pay attention to genre. Rule number six, remember that writers sometimes said more than they knew. So that Old Testament writers were writing sometimes beyond their own comprehension. So that the rule that sometimes said, says interpretation must be limited to authorial intent, the intent of the original author, well, yes, if you mean God as the original author, but not necessarily if you mean the human author, because human authors wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit beyond that which they themselves were capable of understanding. Rule number seven, distinguish between description and prescription. When Noah gets drunk, when Abraham lies, when David commits adultery, the Bible describes these events, and sometimes in fairly graphic detail, but they are not prescriptions for us. So that 
the historical passages of the Bible must be interpreted in the light of the didactic and moral passages of the Bible. Rule number eight, no interpretation can ever, ever contradict the gospel. No interpretation of the Bible can ever contradict the gospel. It can never contradict justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Whatever and however we explain the use of the law as a moral guide for Christians to become more like Jesus Christ, we cannot interpret that in a way that contradicts the essence of what the gospel actually is. Rule number nine. Be careful about word studies. Be careful about etymology, that the meaning of a word or the meaning of a passage lies in the root meanings of words. Sometimes that is true, and sometimes it provides wonderful illustrative material for preachers. But you know, the word nice comes from a Latin word which means ignorant. So beware of word studies. Ten, and here I might get into some trouble, beware of a false Christocentrism. Finding Jesus in every passage. Yes, be sensitive to where you are in the timeline of redemptive history are you, are you in the patriarchs? Are you in the period of the conquest? Are you in the post-exilic period? Are you in the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament? Are you in shadow or fulfillment? Yes, be sensitive to where you are in the timeline of redemptive history, but not every text of Scripture speaks directly about Jesus. The more important question is not where is Jesus in this text, but what is Jesus saying in this text? You can hear Jesus in every text, but you may not always be able to see Jesus in every text. So does that mean if I follow those ten rules, I'll understand all of Scripture? I will always come down with R.C.'s interpretation? Uh, no. Because of the irrational nature with which we sometimes think, because as Peter said about Paul, there are some things in Paul that are hard to be understood, but there are those things, you all know there are those things which are first of all. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, there are things that are, first of all, that Christ died, that He rose again according to the Scriptures. There are primary truths, and then there are secondary truths, and then there are tertiary truths. There are things that are absolutely clear and for which we must be prepared to die for. And I mean, I mean literally to die for. The doctrine of justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, apart from the works of the law, is a doctrine we must be prepared to die for because it is clearly taught in the entirety of Scripture. But is my particular interpretation of 1 Peter 3 and preaching to the spirits in prison, is, is my interpretation absolutely right? Well, if I'm speaking to Ligon Duncan with whom I work, it is because he takes a different interpretation. And I insist that mine is right and his is wrong. No, I think it depends on which day of the week it is what my interpretation of 1 Peter 3 actually is. And there are at least five semi-viable interpretations and several that are definitely wrong. 
Let me end with this. You need to be assured. You, you, you don't need to be wary. You don't need to be tossed to and fro by the post-modernity of our age that simply resorts to the statement, that's just your interpretation. Because true, valid, rock-steady interpretation that will stand the time, the test of time and eternity, if based on those ten principles, can be attained. God has given to us an extraordinary gift in the Bible. Let's treasure it, and let's be assured of that which it contains. And let's, yes, for those things that are first of all, let's be ready to give our lives for them. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank You for the infallible, inerrant Word of God. We thank You that holy men of old wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that none of it is from private interpretation, but is God-breathed and God-given. Grant to us a greater and greater understanding, so that in understanding we might be men, mature and bold and steadfast, and all for Jesus' sake. Amen.